Thank you for joining us for the Ask Me Anything virtual series hosted by the University of Georgia Alumni Association. My name is Debbie Daniel and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement for the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. The Franklin College has been the cornerstone of the University of Georgia since 1801. We are the oldest, largest, and most academically diverse college at the university. As a matter of fact, the top five most popular undergraduate majors at UGA are housed within the Franklin College. These five majors include biology, psychology, English, art, and history. Franklin is the beginning. The numerous departments in the Franklin College offer courses that create an entry into a wide variety of careers. And our introductory courses meet requirements for and support all academic programs at UGA. So each alum joining us today, you started off in the Franklin College and we are delighted to have you join us today. Today I'm privileged to serve as the moderator for the Ask Me Anything session titled, Why Does Psychology Matter in a Public Health Crisis? To discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome one of Franklin College's finest and our special guest, Dr. Michelle Vandellen. Dr. Vandellen is an associate professor here at the University of Georgia in the Behavioral and Brain Sciences program. She received her PhD in social psychology from Duke University. Her training is in understanding the thoughts, behaviors, and emotions of people. She's basically the most educated and scientific people watcher you could imagine. Her specific area of expertise is in self-regulation, how people manage their goals. She studies goals in the sense that people regularly think about them, like go goals to get a promotion or to lose weight, and how we pursue these goals so that we don't even know that we have. Dr. Van Dellen has won many awards, including awards from two leading psychological associations in the United States that are relevant to her field. The Dan Wegner Theoretical Innovation Award and the George A. Miller Prize. So with no further ado, I will turn the program over to Dr. Van Dellen, who will succinctly describe her work in about 15 or 20 minutes and then answer questions. So please be thinking about what you'd like to ask. Dr. Van Dellen. Okay, awesome. We did it. Thank you, everyone. This is my first virtual talk, so I appreciate your patience while I get it set up. I can't see any of your faces, but I hope you're going to be smiling and nodding along while I talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk about why psychology matters during a public health crisis. This is a medical crisis, so a lot of people are turning to disciplines like biology and chemistry and medicine to try to figure out how we can address the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm hoping to make the case today in a lot of broad examples that psychology is going to matter a lot in how we cope with and manage this crisis. So I'm going to be talking about three different case studies, just three different small snippets of ways psychology might actually relate to the current crisis. Each of these is going to be really brief. I'm going to cover just a little bit of information. So as you're listening, go ahead and jot down questions that you have, and I can come back to the things you want to know more about at the end of the talk. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is actually related to some research that one of my graduate students conducted just this last month about how people respond to sheltering in place recommendations. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about this huge multinational study that I've been a part of called the PsyCorona Project. Um, and I'm going to talk about two different early findings that we have from that project that are helping us understand how people are coping with and reacting to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me jump right into case study number one. This is a research project that was inspired because of the fact that local, state, and federal governments were asking people to shelter in place, to stay home except in the case of essential activities. And what my graduate students and undergraduate students and I wanted to know is how are these recommendations or requests actually affecting people? So how are they actually interpreting these requests? And of particular relevance to my research, is whether or not people 
would experience a self-control conflict when they wanted to leave home. So the idea of staying at home is actually really counter to what people do every day. So shelter in place recommendations actually ask people to stop doing what they regularly do. Um, and what we actually know about this is when we ask people to not do their normal behaviors, it can take a lot of self-control. Think about somebody who bites their fingernails a lot and they have to stop that habit. Asking people to stay home, to not go to work, not go to school, not hang out with their friends, not do basically everything else that they do, is basically asking people to override all of their habits at the same time. And one of the things we know happens when people are trying to manage these different self-control conflicts is that they often try to make up excuses or reasons to get to break the rules. So somebody you know bites their nails a lot they'll maybe snap at you if you tell them not to and they'll say oh well i'm really stressed out today so i shouldn't have to worry about it they're looking for a reason to be able to indulge in that temptation or that automatic behavior my students and i were really interested in whether this might actually happen with shelter in place recommendations so if people might actually make up reasons to leave home so what we actually did is we ran a research study and we conducted this study on april 6th so just to put that in perspective, that was about a week or two after shelter in place recommendations had been instituted federally at the US level, and they had already been extended out to April 30th at that point. So people knew what they were getting into and they knew that there was a lot of time coming where they would need to be staying home. We recruited participants through an online panel and we showed them one of two different situations. So this was actually an experiment that involved random assignments. In one of the situations, we asked people to think about going grocery shopping. And in another situation, we asked people to think about meeting up with a friend at an outdoor park. So you can see these hopefully on the left and right side of your screen. Uh, in both situations, we implied that people would engage in social distancing. The really big difference between these situations is simply that one is for a clearly essential item, groceries, and the other is for a less essential item, socialization or exercise. Now, exercise was considered approved as an essential um, activity during the shelter in place guidelines, but you wouldn't necessarily have to meet up with, at a park, you wouldn't have to meet up with a friend. There's some aspects of the situation that make it a gray area. So after we showed people these situations, we asked them several questions. I'm only gonna talk about two of them right now. One of them is, we just ask them, do you see this as a situation that involves a conflict between what you want to do and what you should do? And then we also ask them to guess how many people they think in the US are completely self-isolating. And this question we asked on purpose to see if we could catch people making excuses to leave home. We thought that it might go up when people were in that condition where they were thinking about their friend, when they were really tempted. So let me first turn to this question about, do you see these situations as involving self-control conflict? I'm gonna throw a few statistics at you today, but not many. Again, if you have more questions about them, I'll be happy to answer later. The big difference I want you to see here is that when we ask people to think about meeting up with a friend, they actually did report feeling more conflict than when we asked them to think about going grocery shopping. The difference is small, but statistically meaningful. Another thing that happened here is that we saw a wide variability in reactions to the prompts. So some people actually reported a lot of conflict in the grocery condition, and some people actually reported no conflict in the friend condition. We had participants on the full range in both situations. So I'm gonna turn next to this question about what percentage of people in the US you think are completely self-isolating and not leaving home at all. One of the things that we found that matters when people were thinking about this question is actually their trait self-control. So these were, this was measured with some questions we asked people outside of those other two questions I showed you. Basically, it refers to people's chronic or general abilities to override their automatic tendencies. So we all know people who are really good at self-control and we know people who are not so good at self-control. And that's what we were trying to get at with our participants. What we found is that when we presented people with either the groceries or the socialization prompt, if people said, hey, this just isn't really a big deal to me, I don't feel that conflicted right now, 
that they guessed about the same percentage of people in the US would be self-isolating. They guessed about 15%. But when the grocery store prompt or when the socialization prompt produced high conflict, that is people really said, I feel conflicted about what I want to do and what I should do, we saw this effect of trait self-control, such that people with low self-control were really lowballing the percentage of Americans they thought were isolating. Basically, they were saying, nobody else is doing this, why should I? Whereas people with high self-control were actually increasing their estimates of people that were staying home maybe because they were trying to convince themselves not to go out. So my quick take home message for this case study is simply a reminder that anytime we're making public health recommendations, they're gonna have some psychological side effects. The side effects I was talking about here were experiences of self-control conflict, but you'll see a lot of other recommendations have different side effects. It's really gonna be important for us to understand that people react to these recommendations differently and they might not always cope with them effectively. And we need to think about that when we're in, um, in order to inform our public health policies. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about this big, huge project that I know a lot less about, but there's a lot more information to know. It's called the PsyCorona Project. This is a project that was started by my colleagues Pontus Leander and Jocelyn Belanger. Um, currently, we have over 50,000 human participants enrolled in the study. And we've been collecting data since March 20th. So we have 50,000 participants who have been completing surveys for over seven weeks. In these surveys, we measure things like attitudes, beliefs, mental health, relationships, health behaviors, and a whole host of other things. We're hoping to be able to use this data to understand how people reacted to the pandemic, especially over time. If you're like me, your thoughts and feelings about things have really changed a lot as circumstances have changed. We're hoping that this survey is going to help us capture a lot of those changes for other people. My job with the PsyCorona project is actually almost as a quality control um, person at the scientific level. So what I'm doing is actually screening every single request from our 115 collaborators to say, you have a good reason to use our data. It's good, it's based on theory. So we have some good reasonable expectations for your hypotheses. And it's also good based on your methods, based on your statistical analysis and based on the way you're using our questions. Some of our researchers have started sharing their findings with the team. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what they found, just to give you some more ideas about how psychology might be mattering right now. So my second case study addresses what on the face of it seems like a biological question. One of the things we know is true with COVID-19 is that men are more likely to die than women. In fact, on average across 35 countries that at the time this research was conducted, were giving um, gender information about deaths the average was 61.2%. So men are making up a disproportionately large percentage of the deaths from COVID-19. And if you just share this with a medical person or a biologist, they would say, well, that must be because there's some genetic or biological predisposition that men have to complications from COVID-19 compared to women. But that's not what psychologists would say. Psychologists would say that a lot of gender disparities actually manifest in how social constructions around gender emerge, and also in some of the ways that men and women think differently. So Robbie Sutton and Karen Douglas are two of the researchers on our PsyCorona team that looked into this potential for psychological differences that might be driving these gender disparities. And one of the things they found is that there seems to be a difference in the proportion of deaths that are male, depending on the country people are coming from. These countries in their sample differ in how much men and women are equally represented in the job markets and, in, and politically. In most countries, men are employed more and more politically involved, but some countries like Iceland, Sweden, and New Zealand have better, um, have less gender disparities. And what Robbie and Karen have found is actually that the degree of disparities is correlated with the proportion of male deaths. Now, if you're looking at this statistic, I know a few audience members have taken statistics with me, so I'll just point out that this is actually a really big correlation at our value of 0.59. 
Um, so actually that means that about 25% of the gender disparities that they observed in their study are attributed not to a biological factor, but to how society is structured around men and women. Usually in these countries where there's more gender inequality, the men do better. But in this case, it's actually increasing their exposure to the virus and increasing the extent to which they're facing the worst consequence, which is death. In our PSY-Corona data, we've also seen some gender differences in thoughts. Men tend to engage in less preventative measures, specifically hand washing. And this difference between men and women is actually partially explained by the fact that men perceive themselves to be less vulnerable to COVID-19. So men don't seem to be see themselves as threatened by the disease as much as women, and that actually pr predicts them engaging in less of the, the common sense behaviors we've heard people need to be engaging in. So men and women are dying at different rates, and this is at least partially due to psychological mechanisms. Okay, so case study number three, I'm gonna to totally switch gears here and talk about conspiracy theories. If you've been on Facebook in the last two months, then you have definitely been exposed to conspiracy theories. These are my summaries of some of the ones that I have seen popping up on my Facebook feed, even as recently as yesterday. I've had fairly well-educated people um, suggesting things like COVID-19 was developed in a lab or somebody's just trying to gain power through this circumstance. Uh, these have all been debunked, but if you're like me, you still have people saying things like, well, what if? Uh, and, and talking about how everybody else is just a sheep if they uh, don't ask questions like this. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is some work that Gennaro Pico and Mariko Rulo have done that connects beliefs and conspiracy theories to the experiences that people are having during the pandemic, specifically related to their financial threat. In our PsyCorona data set right now, people who are reporting more threat are reporting more discontent, they're less happy. And that's actually producing some of the, this tendency to in, uh, engage in conspiracy theory, theorizing, or to endorse conspiracy beliefs. So people that feel threatened financially are more likely to produce these conspiracy beliefs. And that's partially due to the fact that they're really discontent with how society is operating and addressing the crisis. For me, when I looked at this, my big take home message was that conspiracy beliefs to me seem really unreasonable. I'm like this, there's, it's just completely unreasonable that you would make these statements. But when we look at this data, we can see that there actually may be a good reason why people are producing these beliefs. Financial threats are serious, complicated concerns, and people are just trying to feel like they can make sense of the threats that they're experiencing in a society that they don't feel like is um, addressing it. So I'm trying to be a little bit softer in my judgments about other people's conspiracy beliefs. Um, the PsyCorona project is a work in progress. We are still collecting data and we are still analyzing data and figuring out exactly what we know about how people are reacting to the crisis. These questions that I've got up on the, on the slide right now are different questions that have been approved for analysis from our data set. So we're looking at things like boredom, um, accuracy and bias and how we perceive other people's behaviors, um, we're looking at this idea of connected distancing. So uh, are you doing a good job of staying physically away from people, but still interacting with them regularly? We're looking at who it is that's the most likely to main, maintain consistently good mental health. You can see the questions are really all over the place in terms of what PsyCorona is letting us answer. If you haven't already taken the survey, I'm just gonna take this second to say you can visit PsyCorona.org. I'm gonna include this link in the follow-up email that you'll get from the UGA alumni office about this slideshow. And now I'm going to attempt to stop sharing my slides and open up the floor for questions. We have questions rolling in, Michelle, so I'm just going okay. to start. So do you have any comments on panic buying? Uh, so just to confirm, you can hear me still, correct? Yes. And my video is off. I don't know if people want to see me when I'm talking or not. They probably don't. Um, so yeah, panic buying is definitely happening. It seems to me like it's actually decreasing a bit. We have some questions about panic buying um, in the data set, but I don't know what we found yet. And they, I think we may have actually missed the boat on them because we asked the questions a little bit later in 
in March and April. And I think the bulk of panic buying was probably happening right when people found out about the news. Um, social psychology, that's my field, says um, one of the things that drives things like panic buying is actually scarcity, which is the notion that something might be limited or restricted. So when you say something like, this deal is only good until tonight, you see people going out and like spending money that they don't really need to spend. Um, so my hunch is that that's what was happening with toilet paper, that people were like, oh no, nobody has toilet paper. I really need it when they didn't really need it. And also nobody needed it. Everybody thought everybody else was buying it and everybody thought they wouldn't have it if everybody else was buying it. So it was just this whole concoction of like distorted beliefs. Gotcha. Almost like that want and shoulds or that conflict, that inter internal conflict of that self-regulation. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Hannah is asking regarding the first case study that you discussed, uh, do you know if the self-control conflicts translate into a difference in behavior? So in this study, we don't. And part of that is actually because right now research cannot be very behavioral because we're doing all of our research online. So everything I'm doing is actually what's called self-report, where I'm asking participants to tell me, hopefully as honestly as possible, what they're feeling, thinking, and doing. So that particular study actually did not measure behavior. Um, my other research on self-control does suggest that what happens when we experience conflict is that we, when we experience conflict, we either make a rationalization to say, hey, yeah, I can eat this chocolate cake, or we really dig in deep and switch our thinking to bolster our commitment to maybe a long-term goal of eating more healthfully. So the pattern of results we observed suggests that it would play out in terms of behavior where people with low self-control would be probably more likely to break shelter in place. People with high self-control would be probably more likely to stay home, but we don't know for sure. Okay, thank you, thank you. Here's a, a question that Francis is, is providing. Does your data or research show an uptick in mental health issues specifically suicide attempts during this time of isolation? So I don't know the answer to what our mental health data is showing. We are measuring a variety of mental health outcomes, anxiety and depression for sure. I don't think the Psy Corona data set has suicide, um, suicide suicidality or, I, um, or idealization in the data set. Um, I am going to write down a name, though, of somebody that I think has been doing really good research in this area, and I'll include it in Debbie's email so that you can look up some of his research to see if um, there's any data on this. What I've been hearing through the academic rumor mill is that there is an uptick, but it's not as severe as people have been thinking it will be. Um, but that's really still an open question. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question has come through that says, has there been any research around the terminology, like the use of required versus mm -hmm. recommendation language, and whether that recommendations actually compel people to adhere? So I don't actually know of any research on this, and I will tell you, Bethany, that I think it is incredibly needed, because we know that one of the things that happens when we tell people you have to do this, we put restrictions on them, is that they experience something called psychological reactance, where they actually might be inclined to do the opposite of it. People really hate being controlled. On the other hand, like you may have seen in my first study, um, when we say something is kind of a gray area, like it's recommended, but it's not required, that leaves open a personal choice for individuals, which means each person has to decide, today am I gonna leave my house? And every time we're stuck making some of those choices, that's when we can experience this conflict that might produce rationalization or temptations. So there's two opposing forces that are actually working together here to increase our compliance. Because saying it's required is gonna make people angry and not wanna do it. But saying it's gonna recommend, it's recommended, it's gonna let people feel like they're off the hook and they don't really need to follow through. So we're sort of in a bind either way, is my guess. So good. Um, so this next question from Kajal says, this may be off topic a bit, but what is or is there the threshold for our self-control? How long do we think we can keep ourselves quarantined before we no longer see the long-term benefits of social distancing? 
Well, uh, Debbie introduced me as a well-trained people watcher, but I suspect most of you on here are at least casual people watchers. And if you're like me, you can see that whatever threshold we have, we have passed it. <laughs> so that everybody in the US is really itching and ready to get out. Part of that is because we don't actually have a clear endpoint for something. So it's really hard to just keep maintaining your motivation um, without knowing when it's gonna end. Um, but so Kajal is actually a former student of mine who asked this question. And I suspect one of the things she's thinking of is the fact that we know that continuously exerting self-control can be really fatiguing to the point where people will want to take a break. So the longer we're asked to do this, the harder it's going to be to keep doing it and the more likely we are going to um, need to switch to alternative methods to manage the pandemic. Michelle, could you tell us what projects you are most excited about with the Cyclona project? Uh, yeah, so I, I actually just got a proposal approved today. So I'm the, I'm the chief approver, but I have two other people that work with me and I, got it. I had to run my idea by them in order to make sure it was worth doing by other scientific advisors. So one of my grad students and I are actually gonna be using some recent data to look at how people think uh, wearing medical masks is useful for the general public. You've heard a lot of people talking about wearing masks in terms of like personal protection. And now you'll hear people talking about how wearing masks is useful for protecting other people. I have this idea, I think wearing masks is really useful for our economic goals too, because if we wear masks, then less people get sick and then we can keep more things open. Um, and we're really interested in whether or not people can hold beliefs that masks can do multiple things for us. like a mask as a multitasker versus a unitasker, if you're thinking about the kitchen tool model. So we're gonna actually start looking at the extent to which people have these beliefs in tandem. Uh, we also have some questions in there about whether people believe masks interfere with their personal freedoms. Um, so we're gonna be looking at those combinations of beliefs about masks, um, what predicts them, as well as how they predict things like actually wearing a mask and some other beliefs about opening up the economy. So I'm super excited to see what that um, shows. And we hope that you share that data with us. Um, on that note, um, <laughs> one of our persons has, has asked a question, when, since we're talking about masks, that they had gone on uh, vacationing and so they noticed minimal mask wearing and social distancing while away at the coast this weekend. Mm -hmm. You have data that supports that vacationers may be relaxing their habits. So we have just started asking mask wearing questions. I think we will have it in more than one wave in the Psy Corona data set every week is called a wave. So every week our 50,000 participants get a questionnaire to tell us about how things with them may have changed. So I think we're slated to ask about masks more than once, but I don't know that we have data about change yet. Okay. Well, that, that too will come, I'm sure. Yes, every, lots of things will come. And just, just as a reminder, Debbie, that the Psy Corona website that we'll send out is where we'll actually be talking about the final research projects. So when we know our findings, we'll be posting them on that website as well. Perfect. And that's psycorona.org. But we will, like you said, mention that in our, our uh, survey email following this yeah. session. Um, you spoke about gender differences in terms of COVID response. Um, this is a question. Did you find similar patterns in terms of race and class? Um, for example, are, are yeah. different racial or class groups responding differently as well? So we definitely know from data outside of Psy Corona that there are race and class differences in COVID-19 complications. Those seem to be very embedded in um, exposure to pre-existing conditions. Uh, and so again, this seems to be coming more from like systematic problems in our healthcare system as opposed to biological or genetic differences. The Psy Corona project is actually an international project more than it is a study about the US. So we actually don't even have race measured in that data set, which is, I know, very strange to think about from a US perspective. How could you do a project like this and not measure race? But if you think about it, race means something very differently in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in Saudi Arabia. We have questionnaires in literally every country other than China and Iraq. And even then, we have people who live in those countries who are taking the survey. We just don't have people um, who are able to, dis to disseminate the survey. 
So the kinds of ways we would ask questions about race in the US don't really apply to the way we would ask questions about race in such a multinational study. But I do think we have some social class questions. So hopefully we'll be able to get at that data um, eventually. Okay. Um, another question brought on by Matt. He says, I'm an extrovert who is very aware <laughs> too, no conspiracy theories, LOL. He says, about this virus, I'm also a man, have had a heart transplant and do community outreach for a nonprofit medical clinic. I have done okay working from home, but I have, I have had to reset my brain a little, a little bit in order to move from survive to thrive. Um, what advice would you have for someone like him? Man, Matt, those are really good questions. I mean, I'd say you've already started the process by switching from survive to thrive, right? Like an understanding that you're going to have to think differently about what that looks like for you right now. Um, I don't know that the PsyCorona data set has a lot about extroversion in particular in it, but I actually have a colleague in my psychology department here at UGA who's leading the biggest relationships oriented study in terms of how people are coping with COVID. And I think he actually has a blog post about um, extroversion and introversion and how people are coping with or saying they're experiencing problems during the pandemic. So I'm going to include a link to his latest blog post in with my answers to Debbie so that you can read a little bit more about some advice that might be specifically geared toward you. Perfect. I love his comments of survive to thrive as well. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely have to move on because this is going to be a long-term thing. So we can't really just worry about surviving anymore. We have to think about long-term coping strategies. Oh. And on that, what are your thoughts on how stay-at-home orders could be contributing to people feeling a sense of grief? Um, you know, grieving uh -huh. normalcy, grieving seeing friends, loved ones, etc. You'll see a lot of people, there's been a really great Harvard Business Review article that went around that compares the current pandemic to grief. Um, I think one of the hardest things about the grief that we're experiencing is that it does feel very isolated because we're not able to be with people. If you think about the traditional way that you engage in grief, it's very social. There's a lot of hugging, there's gathering. And that's kind of what we can't do now. And even when we can do it like this talk, usually when I talk to an audience, I can see them, I can see their faces nodding and smiling or frowning, and I can respond to them personally. And so even when we do get a chance to gather, it doesn't feel quite the same as it did before. Um, I think we are definitely experiencing grief, and I think we're gonna feel the remnants of that for a really long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, Diana is asking, in regard to the third study about conspiracy theories, do you know how heightened emotions around financial and health concerns may affect group polarization and confirmation bias, especially with how information is shared in the social media, social media era? Sure. So I think a little bit of that finding actually does speak to the heightened emotions because it's suggesting that the financial threats actually did heighten this sense of discontent with society, which is what then led to beliefs about conspiracy theories. So that there seems to be this sort of like process that people are going through where they're feeling threat and they're feeling discontent and then they're more likely to engage in conspiracy theories. One of the things I didn't talk about today in regard to that study is actually that that pattern is, is really magnified among people who feel disempowered. So people who feel like their governments really aren't looking out for them. I should note, again, this is a multinational study. So this is not just specific to people in the US. This is people living in Europe, Africa, Asia, New Zealand, Australia. Almost you name it, we have it in our study. So this is a really generalized experience but we see that the people that do already feel polarized, they feel different, they feel like they're not being taken care of, are the people for whom financial threat seems to be especially provocative. Okay. It's kind of like a, our identity sometimes, isn't it? I mean, we yeah. find who we are with what we do. I work at the University of Georgia or whatever, and with this change, it, it, you know, our behaviors change, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everything about who we are now is, uh, yeah. I mean, how many people are bread bakers now that weren't bread bakers? Right. To go. Exactly. Uh, um, we have a person that uh, wants to go back about your mask. Study. Okay. And um, Rilin is asking, how long does it take for you to conduct research and compile that type of data to re 
to be able to report it out? Sure. So it really is going to vary on the way that we do the research. For the mask question, I think I started having some questions in April around this idea of masks as multitaskers. And the Psy Corona team, more generally, was just starting to think about masks are really important. Everyone's talking about masks. We need to get some data on masks in our data set. They have a really broad um, ethics approval for their study, so they were allowed to get those questions in quickly. So just in case you're not familiar with psychological research, one of the things we have to do is make sure an external board confirms that it's appropriate for us to do the research that we're doing. Um, it's an ethics review process. Um, so thankfully, the mask questions were considered low risk, and we were able to actually get them in eight days later, into a survey eight days later. So we came up with the questions, the data came in last week, and I believe I will get the data today um, since my project has been approved. But the data set having 55,000 people in it is going to be pretty tricky to actually crunch. If you just think about, you know, your computer when it's crunching a really big file, um, it's going to take our computing systems a long time to actually even just conduct simple tests for us. Gotcha, gotcha. But it still seems like a quick turnaround for it. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Um, and I should say the ethics board that is approved the Psychorona study is at the University of Groningen and NYU Abu Dhabi. But the UGA ethics board has been really great about expediting review of studies related to COVID in order to help us facilitate studies. So the first study I talked about, um, we came up with that study and had the data within about three days. So just to put that in perspective, when we really have an idea and we have funding for the idea and we have ethics approval for the idea, we can actually turn it around pretty quick. So Leanne and I ran that study on April 6th and the paper is now under review at a scientific journal um, as of Sunday, I think. So pretty fast turnaround time. Pretty amazing, pretty, pretty amazing. You've mentioned that you're working with over 50,000 participants and I believe, um, a question I have are what are some of the challenges of also working with a team of over 115 researchers? <laughs> yeah, so every researcher has their, um, their pet questions, the things they're really interested in. So my research topic before COVID broke out was all about self-control and self-regulation. So of course I want to do a study on self-control. Um, and so everybody else has this teeny tiny little nugget of research that they are interested in and they're coming to the Cyherna project. You've got 115 voices saying my thing is really important. Um, so I think it's a really big challenge for us to try to negotiate questionnaire space and to try to make sure we're answering, we're including questions that help a lot of people, not just a single person. Um, part of that has meant that instead of using long scales, we use really short scales. So instead of asking 10 questions, we ask one to get an, an idea. But the other part of coordinating so many people is that um, there's some good data security questions. So we need to make sure people are, um, it's appropriate for us to give them the data. So that's part of my job as the scientific review person. We also have to make sure everybody doesn't write the same paper. So we don't want, you know, one team to say, here's why conspiracy beliefs happen. And then another team to say, no, I've got a completely different reason why conspiracy beliefs are happening. We need to make sure that people are, um, that we're telling a consistent story and explaining our data fairly um, throughout all of our research. So just some of the questions. Uh, negotiation. Negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have a question in that says, in the age of sheltering, what are some of the psychological effects you've noticed among so many people using Zoom? Any implications from using video versus not using video? Um, she said that she'd read that too much Zooming or video conferencing can yeah. be stressful, um, you know, from the preparation yeah. to the fewer breaks and things like that. But on a positive side, there are tips for better use of video conferencing for personal and professional purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so this is a really great highlight around how technology is really increasing and decreasing our mental health. So if you think about it right now, you know, if I can't connect with people physically, I can still engage with them socially thanks to this technology, which is a really awesome way that we're benefiting from things like Zoom. But then um, the question asked or talked about fatigue, right? I've heard it called Zoom fatigue. And I'll say, at least for me, it's real. I mean, I can't, I'm going to be wiped out after this and I can't even see myself because I, my video is not turned on. So it's, it's really remarkable how exhausting it can be 
Um, and I've similarly heard that part of the fatigue is due to excessive self-monitoring. Um, but I don't think that we have any specific data about that in this study. Um, my colleague who is doing that study about extroversion and introversion might. So I'll see if maybe that there's some good information there. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we're going to be winding it down. I have just a few more questions. One of them is, is one of my own with the uncertainty, you know, with what the future holds right now. We, you know, we're uncertain what, what next steps are in a lot of things. How mm -hmm. does this affect or impact the decisions that we are making now? So, it, so one of the funny things about psychological reactions to uncertainty is that it actually makes us become more certain about whatever it is we decide. So humans, if you think about it, we have actually a, a biological need to have certainty around our, our situations. So think about like hunters and gatherers, if they saw a big object far away, they needed to know, is that a rock or is that a tiger? It was really important for them to be certain about the situation they were in and to understand how to predict the future. So we have evolved with that desire to be really sure about what's happening. When we don't have that, when our circumstances don't provide it, we just make it up. So we just decide, oh, well, I need to go to the grocery store today. And it's not just a maybe, it's an absolute definitely. I absolutely need new flour to make more cookies because I haven't had any cookies since yesterday. And that is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, right? We really dig deep into these things. Um, and you'll see that happening with everybody in every domain. They're more certain about their attitudes, their beliefs. Political divisiveness is really increasing because that's a thing that people feel like they can be certain about. And um, nobody wants to admit to being uncertain. So they kind of fake it without realizing they're doing it. Gotcha. Um, question, ha ha have any participants contracted the coronavirus or had a family member get it? And if so, has that affected their general outlook? Um, so I don't know of participants, but I will say that my sister-in-law actually had COVID-19 and was a few hours away from being ventilated. And so I can at least say for myself <laughs> that it certainly does change things. I mean, it's a really big reality check when you get somebody who's young um, is facing really significant health issues. Um, she made it. There were about four days where our family did not know if she was going to survive COVID-19 or not. And, um, you know, we got good news at the end of those four days, but I realized that in the U.S. over 100,000 people have not gotten the news that we got. And that's really sobering to think about. You know, I'm, I'm in the midst of doing this Psycorona project, and she was literally hospitalized while I've been conducting this research and reviewing these scientific protocols. So all the scientists that you're seeing out there that are doing this work are also potentially being personally affected by it. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll also speak to that in a little bit less <laughs> emotional way to say that we did see some differences in our self-control study based on whether or not people were living with someone who was high risk for COVID-19, that we are really seeing some manifestations of concern for people's health um, in terms of how they're making justifications and where they're experiencing conflict. So I do think personal experience is really gonna matter for people. Yeah. Well, we're so glad that your sister has recovered well. So um, thank you for sharing that. So now that we're finalizing everything, um, if members of the University of Georgia community that are listening today are interested in helping support your work, what would, what's the best way that they can help support you? Well, one really practical way is actually to take our survey. So the psycorona.org um, website has the, a link to the survey in it. You know a little bit now about the studies, so you're not completely uh, novice to um, the questions that we're asking, but there's so many different topics and questions in there. And part of um, additional data collection will allow us to see how people are answering those questions differently over time. So if this is the first time you're taking the survey compared to say March 22nd, you know, how are people different now compared to then? Um, yeah, and that, so that's a really free and easy way people can help us out. Um, a lot of researchers in the Department of Psychology here at UGA are studying COVID. So I've mentioned, of course, you know about my research. I've also mentioned my colleague, Rich Slotcher, who's doing work on relationships 
we have uh, several psychologists in the department that are doing work on how people are coping with workplace changes due to COVID-19. Um, yeah, so I think you can visit our department website, think about finding a way that you can make a meaningful difference. Even small amounts of funding can make a big difference for the research that we're doing. Um, my case study number one, that was that spent, that was five hundred dollars. That was our budget. So we, with just five hundred dollars, we were we were able to answer some new questions about COVID nineteen that people hadn't been asking. Well, today has been phenomenal. Thank you, Michelle, very much for your time and and for um, helping us all understand more about ourselves possibly in this health crisis that we are all facing. And I know for sure I will be taking the survey. And uh, <laughs> any way I can. Um, so again, thank you. And uh, as Michelle mentioned, please check out not only the Franklin College website and that of the psychology department to keep informed or to support our college's work. And I'd like to remind all of our viewers today that uh, today's presentation is part of the Ask Me Anything series. So please check out upcoming sessions at alumni.uga.edu. Uh, we'd certainly love to have everybody um, join us again. Um, thank you again, Michelle. We really appreciate it. And uh, everyone, take care. Go dogs. Go dogs.